Hello, Southside Bible Church. This sermon is being pre-recorded now because of restrictions in our city. I want to thank God for the freedoms this morning and the technology that we can get to open our Bibles together and to worship. We're not gathered in one place, but we're bound together as one in Christ Jesus. So I guess good morning and happy Lord's Day to you. I hope everyone's doing well. I can't even begin to tell you how much uh, I miss everyone and gathering together, and I pray uh, you all are well. I, I long for you with the affection of Christ. You're being prayed for. We're seeking out different ways how to shepherd the flock of God in these days through different uh, Zooms and online things and Bible studies. So we hope to advance that uh, even more this week. And I just encourage you again to really utilize the prayer chain just for any kind of needs that you have so we can be praying for one another. There were some hard providences that hit our church in the last couple weeks. Howard and Jeannie Tiffany, of course, we continue to pray for them. And then our dear sister Judy, uh, her son uh, died in a tragic accident and left behind five children. Two of those are his twins who were baptized here just a little while ago at Southside and, and his ex-wife Gina, who uh, the family attends here and, and his girlfriend Jennifer, who watches our live stream. And so we uh, continue to pray and reach out to that family. We have those who lost jobs already and have closed up for a season, personal business owners who have been hit hard. And so we are in some trials, but the, the faith that I am seeing has been unbelievable to watch the presence of God even in our midst. I had a tough couple days. I was just kind of tired and discouraged. And I got a text from these two cute little girls in our church and their younger brother quoting fighter verses that they have memorized and telling me that they love me and I can't tell you how much uh, they encourage my heart. So let's keep seeking by God's grace how to encourage one another and help each other in this season. Well, let me give you then a lay of the land for the next few weeks should the Lord tarry and I be alive. I, I say that uh, more sober than I've ever said it. As painful as it is for me, I'm going to be holding back from Romans until we gather again or till after Easter. <clears throat> we were ready to start chapter two. As I have been uh, talking to many of you, we we're about to get going on that. And what I've just been watching and seeing the hard providences and, and people weary and tired and struggling. Uh, Romans chapter two is to help the the, the self-righteous to see their condemnation and their hypocrisy. And we would have spent five weeks looking at that. So I've just been uh, led of God that we will come back to that and return. But that would not be the wisest uh, thing for this season. So what we're going to do this morning is I'd like for you to turn to Isaiah chapter 41 with me. And we're going to look at one of my favorite verses in the Bible. <laughs> Last week we looked at my life verse for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And this week, my life verse for comfort. And that is what I want to give you this morning is I just want to give you comfort. As, as Isaiah comes to chapter 40, God says, comfort, oh, comfort my people. And that's a desire of my heart and my prayer for you in this sermon. So this verse has been my comfort in every high and stormy gale. I've been giving it to many of you in your toughest trials, and, and I've used this as a comfort many, many times, and yet I've never preached on it. And so this Sunday, I give you my favorite comfort verse in the whole Bible. And may the Spirit of God comfort all of you this morning with it. So let me read Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. And I will strengthen you and I will help you surely. And surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. May we go to our God and pray now for this verse. Father God, I come before you now. And I pray as these saints are listening now to this sermon, I, I pray that your spirit would take these words and you would comfort your people. God, I pray that your spirit would now come and illuminate these words, that, that they would see these as the words of God, they would see it as truth, and it would give them a comfort. It would take away fear, it would take away anxiety, 
and it would make the righteous as bold as a lion. And so, God, I pray that you would come and you would do now what no human being can do. Minister in power to Southside Bible Church, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to set a little context before we begin this morning. This was written by the prophet Isaiah, obviously. This book is very messianic in nature. One man has called it the gospel of Isaiah. In it, God is telling us how he's going to bring his kingdom in, a kingdom that will have no end. And so the book starts off and God is indicting Israel for unbelief. In chapter 1, verse 2, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know my people, do not understand. At last, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly, They've abandoned the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel and they've turned away from him. He says, they're worshiping me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is now just external of God. And so in Isaiah chapter five, verses one through six, Isaiah tells a parable about this beautiful land and it's fertile. And he, he took out all the stones, the Canaanites, he removed everyone, brought them in the promised land, gave them his laws himself. He had every reason to expect good fruit. And the only thing that came was bad fruit. And so God says, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to bring judgment upon you, Israel. In chapter seven through 11, he says, there's going to be a recovery though. And that recovery is going to be tied to the Emmanuel. And that Emmanuel promise that we all know so well, in Emmanuel, uh, Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And of course, that there's one who will be called the, the son of God, the prince of peace, and the government will rest upon his shoulders in chapter nine. And then you get all these prophecies of condemnation, the rest of Isaiah. And we turn to this transition now in chapter 40. And now in chapter 40, God says, now oh, comfort my people, comfort my people. I'm, I'm gonna bring renewal to this nation. There's great chapters on the sovereignty of God and he's showing that God then is a sovereign savior of his people. I'm the, the one to look to for salvation. No other hand can save, no one but me. And that is the section that we find ourselves in this morning. And our focus is going to be on verse 10, God's great promise to us that I just read. But chapter 41, verses 1 through 9, are really the prongs that we're going to take that beautiful diamond and set it on. And so I want to look at those truths first, and then we'll open up these glorious promise that are in verse 10. So I want to give you an outline to help us journey these truths this morning. I want to ask four questions concerning then this promise in chapter uh, verse 10. First, who makes the promise in verses one through four? Who is this promise not made to in verses five through seven? Who then is this promise made to in verses eight through nine? And then what is the promise we will look at in verse 10? So look with me at our first point. Who makes the promise in verses one through four? Really the, the depth of trust that we can place upon a promise that has been made to us is truly based on the one who is making the promise. And so I'm certain that there's none of you listening right now who have been not been hurt by some promise that was made to you and was not kept could be as big as a vow to marriage or as small as maybe a ride to the airport. But we've all been hurt by broken promises. And the reason they're broken is because the person making them was unable to do what he promised or they were unwilling to keep their promise. And so quite simply, our assurance of a promise made and that promise being kept is founded upon the character and the ability of the one then who makes the promise. 
That determines to what degree we can actually trust that promise. And so who is the one who is making this grandiose promise of verse 10? And I want to show you that from our text this morning. Look with me in verse 1. <clears throat> kind of an interesting phraseology. Behold, my servant whom I uphold. I'm sorry. Chapter 41, verse 10. Coastlands, listen to me in silence and let the peoples gain new strength. Let them come forward. Let them speak. Let us come together for judgment. And so this is really God asserting his, his authority here as God with the nations. He's calling for all these people who are making other gods and looking to other gods, come and gather and make a case against me. Come bring your arguments to me. Come into my courtroom. I will listen, but come let us come together for judgment. And it's really showing that the Lord here is the judge of all of the nations. One preacher said the nations give an account to God, not God giving an account to them. And so God is coming in and saying, give an account. I just want you to see who is the one making the promise in verse 10. He is the God who is the judge over all the nations. Secondly, I want you to see in verse 2. Who has aroused one from the east? whom he calls in righteousness to his feet. He delivers up nations before him and subdues kings. He makes them like dust with his sword and the wind-driven chaff with his bow. He pursues them, passing on in safety by a way he had not been traversing with his feet. So moreover then, now he says, God is not just judging the nations but he's the ruler over the nations as well. He lifts up kings and he throws them down. We see that throughout our Bibles with Nebuchadnezzar and Herod's and David's and Solomon's and lifting them up. The context is talking about God raising up Cyrus and he will come in and conquer the greatest world power at the time called Babylon. Who can destroy a world power? He's just going to come and mow them over and your feet won't even touch the ground, he says. The whole book of Isaiah declares that God does what he wants with the nations. They're like dust on a scale to him. Thirdly, in verse 4, who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first and with the last, I am he. He's called forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, Yahweh, the first and the last, I am he. And this blows me away. He is the judge of the nations. He is the ruler of the nations. And he's the creator of the nations. He spoke the nations into being. And do you see why Isaiah is going to cry out in just a few chapters? Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there's no other. I am God and there's no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. That is the hand the promise that we're going to look at in verse 10 that says, surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is the one who makes this promise to us. And that is why this promise is absolute bedrock. And I'm going to keep going and I'm going to solidify in your hearts all the more who is making this promise. So our second question who then is this promise not made to? Who is it not made to? It's very important that we realize this is not a universal promise for everyone. This is not made to the whole world. This is children's bread. 
And so I want to show you who it is not made to, and then we will look at who it actually is made to. So begin in verse 5 with me, who it's not made to. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and have come. They have seen the majesty of this God that has just been described in verses 1 through 4. But what they do with it, each one helps his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong. And so the craftsman encourages the smelter. And he who smooths metal with the hammer encourages him who beats the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good. And he fastens it with nails so that it will not totter. He will destroy world powers as nothing. The nations will respond to such power, not in repentance and in humility. It's again what we saw in Romans 1. When you see this creation and know there's a God, you should give glory and thanks. And here again, they flee to idolatry. Instead of running to God, they run to idols. I hope you're starting to see the pattern of this world. Man will run to anything except God. They fear and they they run together and they're all afraid and they make idols. And man just wants to be the captain of his own ship. And it's hard when they realize they're the under rower on the ship. They're, They're frightened when they realize who God is. When nations come in to destroy us in this context or the threats of our life, it's scary. We want a manageable deity, and so we make one. We run to something of our own making or our own doing to find comfort in a time like Isaiah is in this passage. A little small thing like a virus can take down nations. And we run together, and we plan to skin, scheme so we can be okay. And we say to each other, be strong. We can get through this together. We're the world. We can accomplish this. We have technology. We have science and medical abilities. We have financial structures. Be strong. Make little wristbands that say, be strong. But now, all of our idols are almost broken at once. Our health, our finances, our governments, our planning, our food, our jobs, down. And so many have been exposed and their idols are tottering. And you need to fasten them with nails so they won't fall over. They can't deliver is the message of Isaiah. Isaiah says they go and they get a piece of wood and they carve it and they they make an idol out of it and worship that. I just ask you as straight as I know how, what is that going to do for you? And many are vulnerable and afraid, and they're running together and say, be strong, and it isn't working. Our idols are not giving us peace. They're not working at a time like this. Without God, you're afraid, you're anxious, you're weak, you're helpless, and you're sinking the five things that God's going to promise in verse 10 to give us. And so I need something more than an idol. And I just pray that there might be someone listening right now and your helpless idols and you're crying out saying, oh God of Abraham and Jacob, help me because I can't help myself. I'm going to give you a better remedy than any idol that you've ever held or run to. There is a remedy for what you're facing even this day. So then who is this promise made to? Look with me in verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. And so I want you to get this. This promise is made to the people of God. And I, I want this to be clear. There are not two worlds out there. One world for idol worshipers and one 
one for God worshipers. One day they'll each have their own destination eternally. But right now we dwell in the same world and we have the same fall and the same trials and struggles and weaknesses and dangers. And coronavirus, we don't live in Goshen. We're touched by it. And we're suffering and we're battling like everyone else. We're all quarantined. We're all suffering financial setbacks. And we are vulnerable to this virus. So what I need as a child of God then is help in this world with so many threats and dangers and hard outcomes that could come in the future. I need something, something that an idol cannot take care of. I need a promise like verse 10. And oh, do I need a promise like verse 10, amen? So who can put their head down on the pillow of the promise of verse 10 that is so big? There's only a certain head that belongs on this pillow. And in verse 8, it's, You Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen. The only reason we're not still worshiping idols and looking for them to help us is the free sovereign grace of God. Abraham was an idolater worshiping the stars. And God went after him and he called him out and he saved him for himself. It's all of God's grace that you have any kind of a special relationship with him. God pursues idol worshipers. Israel, you were not any more special than the other nations. You were the smallest of the tribes. I loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I drew you to myself. The foundation of grace is that God initiated it with us. And it was not based on anything in us, merit or demerit. It was God who did it. He initiated it. Our relationship with God is not based on our performance, our love, our obedience, or how well we handle corona. It's based solely on the electing grace of God. And that is what I love about the new covenant. Our relationship with God is based solely on his love, his grace, and his faithfulness to his promises. It all hangs on him, and it all hangs on his doings. The promise is ours, not because of how good we are, but how good he has been to us. And he says he's a descendant. We are descendants of Abraham, my friend. The beauty of covenantal blessing is faith in Christ. And now we are the friend of God. A friend. <laughs> One who loves me now. God loves me. And Abraham, the, the, the friend, the descendant of Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham. And God said, I will do this. I will do that. And he comes and, and Abraham believes it. And then God ratifies the covenant in Genesis 15. We've gone over this before. But the way a covenant is you cut animals in half. And then the two parties would walk in between them saying, if I don't keep this end of my bargain of the covenant, may I be split in half and killed like these animals. And the beautiful thing is Isaiah gets this, or not Isaiah, I'm sorry, Abraham gets this vision and there's this golden, this on fire iron flax that comes through and God walks in between those animals and he is the only one going through because he will do everything in order for this covenant to take place where God will love us and bless us and be one with him. The covenant is what God will do to make us his children and his son, Jesus Christ. This blessing is for the ones who believe in the seed, Jesus Christ, who would come and live the life that we should have and die the death that we deserved. And when we have the faith of Abraham, we are brought into this covenantal love and promise that God has done in his son. This is truly grace. We who have the faith of Abraham are the sons of God. We are the friend of God. And he says, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts. The Hebrew word for have taken, it means to seize or to grasp. God lays hold of us. God goes to the darkest corners of the earth. That is our church from every angle. 
And that is why we have hope for anyone who has lost loved ones, anyone that you just think they're so far gone. He goes and he seizes them and he grabs them and he brings them in to the covenant of grace and saves them. And he says, I have chosen you and not rejected you. Positively, I'm the one, a conclusion statement, I've chosen you and I have not rejected you. So just description after description that you belong to God, you're loved by him and you've been chosen by him and you are accepted by him based on his grace and his work in his son. Because I tell you this, it will come under attack and he will not throw you off, child of God. This virus is not that God has left us. Some of the sufferings and fears that you are facing are not because God has left. Israel was at a time to doubt God being there for them. They're being cast away into Babylonian captivity. And they're just, they're going to lose loved ones and die and suffer and lose their homes. There's going to be so much that's going to come on this nation. They've rejected God again and again with idolatry. And they're suffering. And in the middle of it, in the middle of our pandemic, God says to his people, I've chosen you and I've not rejected you. In chapter 40, they cry, where is God in all of this? And the answer is, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and surely I will help you and surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God has not rejected us. In Christ, I have an unconditional love and grace who will not turn away from doing me good all of my days. And I could sing of that all of my days. So I want to look who makes the promise, the God who judges and rules and creates nations. Who is the promise not made to? It's idolaters trying to be strong in all their own doings. And who is the promise made to those whom God has chosen and loved and drawn near to himself through the work of his son and our faith that he gives us as a gift. And my last question then is what is the promise? Two commands, do not fear and do not anxiously look about you. They're both commands. And then that, what I love about Christianity is it doesn't just give you commands and you go work it up. He gives you five reasons of how it works. I'm with you. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's look at the commands. Do not fear. So many times in the Bible, why? Because we're, we're prone to fear and we're prone to quit looking to what we're going to look at this morning. We start looking at the waves like Peter did and we sink. We're prone to run to fear. And God is going to command us as children of God who are loved in this covenant, do not fear. Do you want to know the first time that appears, that command? In Genesis 15, 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Don't fear, Abram, because I'm making a covenant, a covenant that you no longer need to fear God because you're going to be loved and accepted. And then he says to Isaac, do not fear and to each generation. Fear is not where the people of God run. Babylonian captivity is upon them. Do not fear. And my question is, I want to know how. I don't want my lungs to shut down. I don't want to sit at a home, sit at my home with a virus, praying that my wife lives while she's on a ventilator. When I got a phone call from Howard, this became real. To me with a club over my head with my second parents fighting for their lives. I don't want that. Monday evening, I had to run over to Judy's house to beat the police, to hold her. And she was told that her son was dead. One of my greatest fears. 
I had to go with her to share with her five kids of her son, her grandchildren. And I, I saw pain like I've never seen in my life. I sat with his girlfriend shaking, who had to go through a horrific night. So how do we not fear when these things can happen to the people of God? I don't get a free pass. Do not anxiously look about you. When we fear, we then get anxious because of what we're afraid of. And then we start looking to the left or to the right. Israel started looking to Egypt for help. And we start looking to a stimulus package or whatever it is for help. We start looking anywhere but to the Lord. It's interesting, the word anxious, the the opposite word for it is to wait on the Lord. To wait on the Lord. Just flip back one chapter with me and look at Isaiah 40, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice do me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength, And they will mount up with wings like eagles and they will run and not get tired and they will walk and not become weary. To wait on the Lord is to quit looking for any other way to solve your problem. It's to stop your own hands and your own wisdom and your own efforts and look to God and wait on Him to do what only He can do. And when you look and wait on Him, you will get this power that we're going to look at this morning and you will run and not grow Weary, amen. The promise, the promise, the cure for my fear and my anxiety in the time of crisis, like Israel was in, what are they? First, I am with you. If you're quarantined, you're not alone. If you're single, you're not alone. The great promise of the Bible, I want you to hear this so clearly, He's with us. I don't know of a greater promise. I always remember this time, and I was a little boy, and there were these junior high, high school kids picking on me, and and I was scared to death. And I remember when my dad walked up, and he grabbed my hand, and he turned to those bullies, and man, they backed down quicker than anything, and I just remember walking to the car at peace. And uh, just... He's with me. You're, I just, right now, I just want you to hear that. He's with you. Your Father in heaven, who's the sovereign of the universe, is with you. He, he's not sleeping. He doesn't take a break. Do not fear, for I'm with you. And don't anxiously look about you. Secondly, for I'm your God. And this conveys all that God is for us in Christ. All that he is, is directed towards you for your good. Jeremiah 32 says he delights over us with all of his heart and soul to do us good. All of his divine attributes are for us. I am your God. I don't need to look all around, to the left or to the right, for idols to comfort or help me. I look to God. Where does my help come from? My help comes from him, the maker of heaven and earth. Don't be anxious, because I'm your God. What do you need to worry about if I'm your God? Thirdly, I will strengthen you. It's funny, they said in verse 6, because of their idols, be strong. Be strong because of our idols and all that we've made. These idols can't help them. But our God will strengthen us. This is a real strength. And as weak as I feel during this time, and it's just wearing me down and depressed, God's saying, I will strengthen you. I will give you the strength that you need to keep persevering in grace and love to our God and to one another. 
surely I will strengthen you. And fourthly, surely I will help you. And so I want you to hear that whatever you encounter in the future, in the present, I will help you. Whatever you're worried about, whatever can happen in the future, right now, what you can ever can create in your mind, he's saying, when it comes, I will help you. You need not fear or be anxious about your future because this God, your Father, who loves you eternally, will help you. How am I going to pay my bills? When I went over to see Judy, she ended up praying and lifting up my heart with that news. Howard, his faith, he said, Jeannie's in God's hands. And with joy and confidence, he left his wife perfectly where she needed to be. I had a man who lost his job and his wife lost hers this week. They're holding on by his shoestring and credit cards. And I don't know how, he said, but we're making it and our marriage is better than it's ever been. I've been at this for almost 30 years and I have seen this true in my life and in everyone I've ever shepherded as a child of God in the times of trouble. Surely I will help you. Testimony after testimony of how God helps his children. And surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That hand of character and strength, the one that holds and rules the nations, the one that holds the universe, will hold us up. He will not let you fall. He is never weary and he will not let you fall. Omnipotence will hold me up and stand you will. I feel like I'm going to fall and break. Just throw in the towel. I just want you to hear that. He upholds me. <laughs> the promise of God to the people of God. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. We are loved because of Christ. And to the people of the faith of Abraham in this seed, Jesus, that God will do all that is needed for our blessing. And we can have God now to be our God. And when he is our God, oh my. The God who judges the nations and rules over them and calls them into being. He calls his people out from the nations to be his people. That God says, do not fear and do not anxiously look about you. For I'm your God. I'm over you. And I am with you. You're beside me and I will help you from whatever angle they come from and I will strengthen you from the inside and I will uphold you from under you you need not be afraid I will strengthen you and help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand I want you to lay down on this promise child of God during our captivity and our trial it is yours. Be comforted, my dear flock, and your God who is for you. Amen. As I close, I do want to address, if you've tuned in and you are looking for answers and your idols, they're just not working, the God that I have just described could be yours. He so loved this world that he sent his son into it and his son came into this world and he went up on a cross and our sins were placed upon him and God poured out his full wrath for our sins the, the soul that sins must die and Jesus bore that wrath and he died on that cross and he was buried in a grave and on the third day he was raised from the dead to tell us that that accomplished salvation and now there is salvation in no other name and the one who will believe upon this Christ will be saved and you will be adopted into the family of God. And now the promises that I just went over will be yours. You don't have to fear and you don't have to be anxious because this God is for you. And it's to be received by faith. 
is to believe this gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. So I pray that you would reach out through our website and get a hold of us, and, and we would love to help you in this journey. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beauty of Isaiah 41. Oh God, what a promise, what a blessing. Lord, I, I love this flock so much, and I know there's many who are struggling, and we're all up and down. We have seasons of steadfast trust and seasons of fear and creeping in of anxiety. Oh God, I pray that, that the truth of these verses now would drive out, your perfect love would drive out all fear, would drive out anxiety. God, you are all around us, surrounding us. You're our God, you're with us, you're upholding us. Oh, I pray, let every saint have the eyes of faith to look right now into these truths and this promise for the people of God. And because of Jesus Christ, we cannot come out from this beautiful love and commitment that you have to us. And so let no heart think he's gone too far, he's too bad, or he's handling this trial so poorly. God, I, I pray, let them lift their eyes again and see where their help comes from. My help comes from God, I pray. Let them call and, and look and believe and look their eyes out right now at that beautiful Christ. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. And all God's people said, amen.